Welcome to the 10 Ideas 50 Years video series. Uh, this is video number 5. I'm Jeff Cliff, and I'm trying in this series to get across 10 ideas that I think are important, uh, that perhaps if you went back in time 50 years and you only had 10 ideas to take back, this would be one of the 10. Um, and so this is going to be a paper from the Journal of Management Science, some thoughts on the Minimax Principle uh, by Robert Amon and M. Mashler. Uh, Robert Amon should be familiar to you from previous videos. Um, and so just as a reminder, the, the point of this video is not to give an in-depth uh, view of the proofs involved uh, and the mathematical basis of game theory uh, or anything of that sort. It's just to get the ideas in question across. So if you were to encounter them or if you were to find yourself in a situation where they applied, you would at least know that these ideas kind of are out there, that they exist, uh, and that you should, if it's applicable, perhaps do some more research into it, but just so that you're aware that this exists. And so this idea specifically, or that this paper, uh, came from, as mentioned, the International uh, Game Theory Workshop in Jerusalem in 1965. So this was at the height of the Cold War, uh, right before the 67 war, which Israel was not sure at that time that it was going to win, uh, or, or do as well as it did. Uh, so there was a, a lot of worry in, in, in attempts to uh, view games as a way of uh, modeling situations and modeling the, 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 the kind of tit for tat or the, 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 the dangerous situation that the two world superpowers at the time had been in. Uh, this was a you know very you know tense time in, in that particular part of the world at the time, and so the, the, this kind of view of uh, a problem uh, was of great importance, and it was of great importance to the resulting history that followed. And so in, in this conference specifically, uh, this, I guess, issue that we're going to bring up uh, had come up before, and it had come up uh, in relation to the areas of game theory that were well understood, uh, that von Neumann and the like had, had dealt with in the past. Uh, but this I guess paradox that we're going to bring up uh, is it, it was found to be, uh, or it was seen in a new light, and it was seen that it was seen in a new light. If I'm pronouncing this guy's name right, uh, Guillermo Owen, uh, one of the founding fathers, or considered one of the founding fathers of game theory, noticed uh, Robert Amon and Dan Mashler uh, dealing with this view of this problem, and found that it was a a wider, uh, of wider application that had been previously considered. And so, as I'm kind of hinting towards here, uh, there, there is a paradox that we're going to kind of discuss today. Uh, and this paradox is not actually new. It dates to the 50s, uh, but there, because they were expanding the, the scope of game theory, and specifically to games of incomplete information, uh, this became a little bit more uh, important to take a look at. Now, uh, to, to kind of, be, before we define the problem, uh, to, to kind of give a scope of the problem, the, 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 the basic uh, part of the problem is that for every game, if you're, if you're in a game, and it's specifically for uh, games that are uh, non-zero-sum games, and games that have uh, concerned incomplete information, uh, you're going to be faced with situations where you can choose a strategy. And you're going to start the game or start the round, uh, and you're going to finish the round. But it, there's this middle point uh, between those two uh, periods where you're actually uh, kind of in game, where you're having to make choices based on this strategy. And it's this middle point that we're going to be concerned with today because. There, there's a problem that comes up in this where you're, you're not at the start of the game, you're not at the end of the game, but you're kind of in-game, and things suddenly start to be not quite as clear as they could be. So, to start with, uh, we want to, I, I guess, define something uh, called chance games. Uh, there, there's probably other terms for this, but the basic idea of a chance game uh, is a 
kind of sub game or, or, a, or a way to play games so that you're 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 playing a strategy uh, based on uh, a, a, a number of different sub strategies or a number of different moves you could play based on checks and so for example if we have this game and we're going to skip to this game because it's kind of a an example game so if, if you haven't seen a game like this it, it's basically you have if player one plays left or player one and player two each have a choice between two things for perhaps the red pill or the blue pill heads and tails um or, or some some other two choices they could make uh and if uh player one and player two both choose l uh then both of them get zero points or zero utils or whatever your, your ranking of, of, of outcomes is for player one playing l player two playing r player one and player two are going to get two uh and etc cetera, etc cetera. and so the chance game is going to basically be a strategy that employs random chance so for example one of them is going to be choosing l half the time and choosing R half the time. So this is going to be a, a chance move or a chance game uh, that you can play where basically your your optimal strategy is to, uh, and we're going to assume that this is actually the, the optimal strategy without going into too much detail how it's the optimal strategy, but it, it turns out that this is for player one the best that you can do, uh, at least by uh, the quote unquote minimax principle. So you, you flip a coin outside of this game, and if it turns up heads, you choose L, and if it turns up tails, you choose R. And so that this is a kind of way of playing these games, so that even if both players can see the coin flip, you, you act on that flip uh, in, in a way that is uh, kind of the, the best way you can act on it. And we can go into detail in previous and further videos on how this is optimal, but for the current moment, we're just going to take on faith or whatever that uh, this is actually the, the, the best way to play this particular game. Uh, if there turns out to be another way of playing this game, uh, chances are we're going to come into the same problem anyway, and so the, the details of what strategy or what game are not going to be all that important so long as uh, the right combination kind of comes up. And so the let, let, let's just take a look at this game and how this is actually going to play. So you flip a coin, the player one, the coin lands, you look at it, it's heads, so you decide you're going to play L. And so that's going to restrict what happens in this game to this kind of top row here. So player one is playing L. And uh, the outcome is going to depend on player two. And so you have, from player one's perspective, it's kind of a 50-50 chance of either getting nothing or getting two points. Um, and so you're going to get basically an expected value of this game of one. And your minimum value of what you can get from this game is zero. And your maximum value of what you can get from this game is two. So uh, this could be you know, just a simple betting game, but as we've seen from previous videos, simple betting games are a good model of other games that uh, can be used to model uh, games of incomplete information and potentially infinite games. So we, we've got to this point where we're, we're in this situation where we, we've perhaps modeled some much more complex game in terms of this much simpler game in hopes of finding an optimal strategy. And so we come up with this, this situation where we have zero and two as our two payoffs. And we notice something a little bit funny about this, which is that we expect to get one from this game, from zero times 50% is zero, two times 50% is one, have the two together is one, so that our expected value is one, but we can guarantee one if we were to play differently. And so we could end up losing and getting zero and getting nothing with the best strategy we have but we expect to get one. Or we can guarantee one and possibly ex expect to get less. But regardless, we can expect to get only what is guaranteed in a different strategy. And so this s 
is kind of a problem. It's, it's a paradox of sorts. We've, we've come up with this strategy that it's assumed to be optimal, and now we have evidence that it's not actually all that good for us. And so the question becomes, do we play this strategy? And so we're, we're faced with this, this, this problem of, uh, in the middle of the game, we, we, we look at both the optimal strategy and what it's going to be leading us towards. And we're faced with this problem of, it, it isn't actually leading us where we want to necessarily go at this point. So it's a, it's a problem in the middle of the game rather than at the beginning of the game. And so we're going to have to deal with this. And so, you know, the, the, they're faced with this problem. And then things get kind of a, a little bit weird from there. Uh, but so, so they, they kind of go into this problem and, and, and you know, the kind of contours of it. And they, they do a little bit of math to, to kind of tease out aspects of the problem. And one of the things that comes out uh, is that this problem demonstrates a difference between the Nash equilibrium of what you can get and the what you can get if you play defensively. And so it, it kind of teases out the two parts of the I mean, minima, or minimax strategy. So this kind of playing to, to win the game and playing to not lose the game suddenly become a little bit different. They're not the same. And assuming that they're the same coming into the game starts to become a little bit different. And depending on what the context of the, the values of these different outcomes are, you may end up playing differently. And so, said differently, you have to choose in this game between playing for yourself and against your opponent. This isn't necessarily the same thing, or at least at a general level. You actually have to make that choice, because it will determine how you end up playing and whether or not you end up sticking with this strategy. The other thing uh, that came out uh, from their research is that you, you could stop and look at this and, and suggest to yourself, okay, well, you know, this is kind of a contrived example, and, you know, maybe these matrices don't actually, you know, come up like this very often, and this is just kind of a, you know, an, an off case, kind of like a, a, an example of how, how game theory or its, its strategies goes wrong, but they pointed out that these actually come up all the time, or, or at least often enough that you actually have to deal with them in practice. Uh, and in particular, they come up if you have one player playing one game and another player playing another game where the moves of each player tra or are, are equivalent to some moves in other game. So that your payoffs are not necessarily the same. In this example, they are the same. But they found that if the payoffs are not the same, this problem comes up more often. And two, if you have games of incomplete information where you're creating a game of complete information based on that game, that situation happens. So you're basically playing two different games where the outcomes uh, of one game are dependent on the outcomes of another, play like this one. Again, that is going to make this game more likely to encounter this paradox. And so there's, you know, the, we're at kind of this impasse right now where. As of about 1965, it's, it's kind of a known paradox, but it's becoming an important one to know things about. So we, we piece apart a little bit of information here. And now, not only is it problematic for player one, I should point out, but this paradox actually kind of cuts across both ways. Uh, on one hand, if you're player one, you flip the coin, you know, you get heads, you are looking at your strategy going, okay, well, this doesn't really do anything for me. And so you throw the, the coin flip up. And so we know based on previous videos that this coin flip can actually add more information and can actually create a, a new or a, a more complex kind of strategy than just picking one option and sticking with it sometimes. And so you should be able to always get more value from it. But in this case, you get no value from it. And so you're basically adding information and then ignoring it. So on one hand, player one is ignoring the information. And on the other hand, player two, if they know that 
player one is ignoring his information, still has to include the possibility that he's not ignoring that information. And so he's basically taking into account information that is known, or that, that is known to be false. And so on one hand, your, your, you know, in, in the event of uh, your, your, you know, being on the one side of this, you're, you're ignoring good information, and on the other side, you're not taking into account, or you're taking into account, uh, or not taking into account information at all. And so you're basically taking into account bad information, and kind of both sides are, are not seen from an outsider uh, perspective, not really dealing with this paradox and this kind of situation uh, all that well. And so, for example, uh, to kind of split apart the possibilities, if heads comes up, player one chooses left, player two isn't going to know one way or the other, so it's going to choose left or right. And so, at this point, uh, your your player two, even if they know the strategy, isn't going to be able to do much to uh, to get to a, a, a equilibrium that benefits both of them. It, it, player two is probably going to play selfishly, and likewise, uh, if player one uh, ignores the strategy, uh, he, he throws away information. Uh, you know, he's still going to get. Well, player two is still going to play the same way, and so player two, even if he knows. Uh, you know, or, or not knows, but uh, he's going to play basically the same way. So it's, it, it, he's not going to take into account the fact that player one's playing this way, and player one's not going to actually, uh, you know, if he follows it, the outcome's going to go one way. If he doesn't follow it, the outcome's going to go the other way. But again, he's throwing away good information. And so the question is, you know, wh what do you do in this situation, and how? How do you deal with this? And the, 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 do you follow this strategy? Do you commit to this strategy? And your you, you could view this in, in, in terms of okay, well, I'll you know follow this strategy in a certain way. But the, the problem, or a problem with that is uh, that whether or not to follow this strategy uh, is going to be phrased in terms of a game of choosing or not choosing a particular strategy. So you basically, at best, move one level up in, in regress uh, by you know, asking whether or not to, to follow this strategy. So, so it's kind of a three-pronged, uh, difficult paradox to approach. And so, you know, th this video has is, is, is not been kind of like the other ones, but the other ones uh, have mostly been, okay, here's a way of approaching a problem, or here's a way of you know, dealing with some topic. Whereas this one, we, we start with this problem, and uh, unfortunately, it's kind of a mean problem. It, it doesn't lend itself to uh, all, all that easy uh, solutions. But based on their looking at this kind of problem, there is one way to kind of approach it. And so, the important thing to know from this video, and what we're hopefully getting across, is that you have to choose whether or not, before the game starts, you're going to commit to this strategy. And you're going to have to choose, or you're going to have to basically tune the game so that you know how much commitment you're going to put onto the strategy before you start. Because if you don't choose to commit, that's going to have implications on how you play. Because you may end up kind of bouncing back and forth and choosing one way or the other uh, and kind of at a higher level before or that, that, that allows you to play different moves uh, than it, if you were to say know, have this strategy, or have a finite level of re regress, and then stick with it. That is going to determine what moves are possible, that is going to determine what moves you actually play. So, before you start playing now, 
whenever you are in a game situation, you can then say to yourself, before you start, what level of commitment should I have? And what outcomes should I expect given different levels of commitment? That is kind of the key idea here, in that you should, as of now, be able to look at these games and choose beforehand your level of commitment. And to kind of bring an example of sort of current events to make this relevant, uh, you know, there, there's lots of examples that we could probably pull from. Uh, but in, in the United States right now, there is kind of a, a back and forth in their Congress and their Senate, uh, where you have two political parties, where one political party is willing to compromise and willing to change their strategy uh, to allow for the other player or the other, I guess, their opponent in, in the political arena uh, to, you know, to to allow them to be to work with them, and, and the other side, the other player or the other party. Uh, is unwilling to change and is committed to their outcome and they're only willing to go to those outcomes. And so th those two parties have basically uh, had a choice made for them or they have consciously chosen, possibly by this paradox, uh, what kinds of outcomes are appropriate based on what level of commitment they have. I'm not saying that this has been explicitly taken into account, but given the history of the United States is kind of steeped in this kind of game theory, uh, one can suspect that there's something like this going on in the think tanks that govern both political parties and the outcomes that those particular uh, parties um, are expecting. And so if you're not uh, aware of this, if you're not expecting this to be true, you may be surprised at some of the things they do and some of the reasons they give for the things that they do. Whereas in light of this, they may make sense. Uh, and, and you really have to ask, what outcomes are they driving for? What outcomes are they actually likely to get using different levels of commitment? And of course, is it working? If, you know, if you're on the inside of one of these two parties, you can ask, well, you know, should we have more commitment? Should we have less commitment? Is the game we're playing, you know, does it facilitate uh, better outcomes if we commit or not commit? Is there something about the game that we're playing that is a one-time shot thing? Or is there something that uh, allows for multiple iterations of the game that makes it kind of more conducive to uh, longer-term strategizing other than Minimax, perhaps? Uh, but again, th this, this is solely fo focused on that particular kind of optimal strategy. But again, this, this paradox will come up again and again, practically no matter what strategy you use. And so it's, it's, it's important to kind of hit it head on. Now, uh, another thing kind of pointed out in the paper is that uh, sometimes you can actually choose how much commitment you get as a player. Uh, if you're a government or a business uh, or a part of a business, uh, sometimes decisions are made by groups, uh, groups of people, or even individual people who can change their mind. And so some of the conclusions, some of the strategies that they come up with, you may end up not being able to stick with and not being able to stand by, even if they guarantee uh, better outcomes, or, or if they are likely to get better outcomes, or if the expected outcome is better, because the, the tendency to go defensive will exhibit themselves, uh, and that will kind of change your uh, ability to reach equilibrium points, or vice versa, if you, you know, want to you know, uh, make decisions uh, purely selfishly, you may find yourself slipping to the other direction as well. So, again, this is a, a, a problem where you, you may be able to tune the, pro the, the properties of your group or tune the bylaws of your, your, your organization uh, or, or the, the, the higher level rules that govern your behavior to either get uh, outcomes you choose or, or not or whatever. Uh, but this is the problem to think about when you're doing this because this is going to come up in practice. So, um, and so this this is a uh, and uh, can't remember if I've gone into that part yet or not. But uh, to kind of reiterate, uh, one, uh, this problem comes up. Two, uh, it comes up specifically when you have different uh, players playing games that impact each other. The, the players moves in the game the other player is playing. Uh, three, this comes up all the time when you have games of incomplete information that are, uh, 
it is associated with games of complete information to solve, uh, as we've seen in previous videos. So this does come up in practice, too. It's a paradox. You have at least one way of approaching, and uh, hopefully you can use that. Uh, again, uh, this has been 10 Ideas, 50 Years. I'm Jeff Cliff. If you have any questions, uh, or if you would like me to go through another game uh, to try to give another example of this, uh, feel free to leave a comment in whatever thread I post this in. Um, you know, we are hopefully all learning together as part of this video series. Um, and uh, tune in next video when we go into more detail of uh, the kinds of situations where commitment is involved. Uh, enjoy.